Hi, everybody. I'm Phyllis Smith and co-founder and managing partner of Wood Free Mindfully. I'm delighted to introduce you to um, these two amazing women who, like us, have programs that support the well-being and success of youth. Specifically, they work with young female athletes, helping them to navigate the often stressful college and athletic recruiting process with greater ease. Both have decades of extensive experience and great success as college athletes themselves and as coaches. So please welcome the founder of Find My Team, uh, Barb Smith, and the founder of Next Step with Passion and Purpose, Willette White. Good to see you, ladies. Thank you. Thank you. So good to be yeah. here, Phyllis. It's so great. And, and just to find other people that are in alignment with us, you know, helping helping our kids just navigate this very challenging world. And in your case, you know, that world of recruiting and getting into college and what college to choose. And I can't imagine the stress. And in some cases, those uh, athletes, that's their only ticket to college um, for financial reasons. So there's a lot of pressure. Um, I, Barb, I want to start with you. So you describe uh, the purpose of Find My Team is to help aspiring female athletes, parents, and coaches by empowering them with the knowledge necessary to make the college athletic recruiting process a positive, proactive, and successful experience. So in a nutshell, how do you do that? <laughs> I think uh, in a nutshell, we start with putting them in the driver's seat. Many times uh, student athletes today are not driving their own their own recruiting process or their, their journey, that it's being driven for them. So we try to put them in the driver's seat and help the parents get in the back seat and really allow these young people to drive. And we have an assessment that we give them that really helps them understand what they might want in a college experience and it becomes their GPS for the process. And I think that is the number one best thing that we can do for these young uh, young student athletes is help them figure out what it is that they want and then help them step by step through the journey of having to make decisions, understand what questions to ask, who to ask, how to write emails, how to make phone calls, and just how to line up the, the process so that it works for them instead of just being a process that they do. Yeah. Uh, we're going to unpack that in a bit. Uh, Willette, I want to ask you, uh, you say the ultimate success of these young athletes just doesn't stop at being accepted into the right college. Um, for aspiring athletes, there are many emotional pitfalls that can take them off the court. In fact, my understanding is that isn't it true that many athletes give up their sport once they get to college? So first of all, why is that? What are the common emotional pitfalls, and what do you do to help them transition into college athletic life so they stick with the sports program? Yeah, thank you, Phyllis, uh, for having us. And um, that's a that's a long question. I'll try to- You can pick one, pick bit. one. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think that many parents feel as though once they do get recruited and find a place to play, that their preparation and it, it's over. Like, um, they've invested so much time and energy into their daughter finding that college scholarship that they just want to be done when the process is over. And it's not because many I've watched year after year, I've watched young women step foot on a college campus, <clears throat> step foot on a college campus, and not be ready for the chaos and all the overwhelming feelings that come with being a student athlete on a college campus. So we try to, we, uh, I have a program in place. Uh, it's an eight week program that uh, provides all the preparation and readiness that a young woman will need once she steps on a college campus. So, so Barb, you start them in eighth grade, right? Yes, if we can get, if we can engage them in eighth grade, I think that's a great time to start eighth grade freshman year in high school um, so that it's not so rushed. Yeah, and so it's kind of a piggyback here. So Barb, you're kind of with them in the beginning, like before and helping them recruit them into college. And then we'll let you, once they get there, you take them by the hand and you help them navigate and transition. 
Am I getting yeah. that in simply? Yeah, in simple terms, that's exactly right. Um, once they find a place to play, which it could be their junior year or their senior year, that's when I'll take over. I would like to, uh, my program is to prepare them for when they step on their college campus. So if I can get them, you know, their junior year, middle of their senior year, like I said, after they make decisions, then that's a great time to, to get started and, and prepare them on what they're going to face. I think that's what's so great about, you know, well, Let and I working together is this, this has to be the most holistic approach to the recruiting process and the transition. We really, we really take it on as, and we're passionate about walking these young females through the process to get there. And then also walking them through that first year, which is the most challenging in the most, you know, in the best sense of the word, it's the most challenging year. And that's when most people, you know, want to jump off the ship and leave. So we really want to prepare them for the whole thing so that they can stay there and then work on what comes next instead of fretting about what they're doing every day. Yeah, and so, I would, I'll add to that ahead. real quick. Um, Phyllis, I apologize. Uh, it can be so chaotic. And you had mentioned in one of your questions that sometimes that first year, many kids kind of fall off the wagon, so to speak. They're um, deciding they don't want to play their college sport. It's just too challenging, too overwhelming. Um, there's social pressures and those, those peer pressures, and that can have an effect on, on an individual's mental health. So um, many times there are women that transfer, but there are also women who decide they don't want to play the sport anymore. Yeah. And probably if they're eligible to play college sports, they've been in that sport for a long time. Do you find that there is burnout by the time they get to college? Because I've seen that. I have a niece like that. She played softball her whole life, got to college, and it was like, I did it a year and she was done. Sometimes yeah. it's burnout. Yeah. Sometimes it's burnout when, in high school, before they get to high school, even. Right. Right. So, what happened? Um, starting with you, Barb, and then Willette, or either way, um, in your personal experience that led you to create these programs you had, you have? Well, like Willette, I've, I've had the opportunity to see the difference between thriving in college and just surviving it. And the thrivers seem to be lined up even after college. So if everybody knew where they could thrive in college, the parents would get behind it. It wouldn't matter cost, level, location. They would want that experience because it's that different than the surviving experience. And I've you know, personally witnessed many of these, but just one story that I had an athlete who, you know, we, we, we were left without a point guard in, a situ in one of my situations as a coach. And so we went hard after this one point guard and everything lined up to be, um, you know, where she was going to be an impactful player. She was going to come in. She was going to be able to beat our point guard. But the only difference was when she was out playing with her club teams and her high school teams, she was surrounded by great players. And when she came to us, she had to carry a major load that she was not ready for. And she floundered. And as a consequence, we floundered. And she ended up wanting to leave. And she was a great player, a great student athlete, came from a great family, but she didn't find the right fit for what she needed. And that really propelled me to understand that that was my responsibility, that I take full responsibility for that. And so I have come up with, that's how I came up with this assessment to help these young women find what they truly do want and what they can handle and what they want to handle in a college experience. So with your program, that same athlete might have chosen a different school, even though you went after her and you wanted her as a coach, you know, it was good for you and good for your team. Had this program be been around, she might've known that's not the school I want to go to. That's not a good match for me for various reasons. And then find another school. Is that, am exactly. I getting that correctly? That's mm -hmm. That's exactly right. She would have, mm -hmm. she would have, and I mean, as a coach, I should have asked those types of questions, but I was going for talent and I was sure. Victor and all that. I didn't dig deep enough. And there isn't time usually for college coaches to do that. So it's really, really, you know, recruiting is tough, 
And so it really falls a lot on the student athlete to, to do most of the work in finding that right college fit. Yeah, and I want to come back to that. Hold that thought because I want to come back to that kind of pressure they get from coaches and the fact that you're one, but there are many who are just looking to, to get their team the best, but you know, they're not asking those questions, right? So we'll let, what about you? What about your experience? Can you pinpoint a, a, an ex, something, an experience that you had with an athlete where had they had you where you are now, it might have come a bit a different outcome? Yeah, as I mentioned earlier, in my 36 years, every year I watched young women flounder and struggle to find their footing as freshmen in this overwhelming, chaotic environment. And some of them come in as this big fish from their high school pond. Now they're this small fish in this college pond and they don't know how to handle that along with time management issues and social and peer pressure issues mm -hmm. and dating violence and academics and the travel and the 6 a.m. to 11 p.m. at night schedule, all of those things. So we really deep dive into those critical topics that they're going to face when they step on their college campus. And had when they sign up for this resource, they're so much more prepared. They're at least able to say, yes, I talked about that. I knew this was coming. To have that preparation and readiness is huge for a young woman. I wish I would have had it when I stepped on my college campus because I didn't have any time management skills, the social and the peer pressure, the pressure uh, to perform. I was the only person of color in my program. All of these things were, were a major issues for me. And so from the time that I stepped foot on my college campus to the time I retired, every year I saw something. Mm. I'll say this, so, if I can just uh, interject. Yes. With you. Um, well, that was my transition bridge in college. She, I had, I had that piece that she's talking about. And I don't know if she knew what she was doing yet back then. I didn't. But she was my, I mean, I, when I struggled, well, that was my person. And she was mm -hmm. there for me and really helped me with that transition into college. And it was, it made it a lot it was a lot different experience. And, and you, you hope that everybody would have something like that. Uh, in a way, we're asking these young people to step up and be their own person and be independent and make a choice. But here, they haven't quite reached full adulthood yet. How do you navigate the parents, first of all, and so that they don't feel they can let go of the reins a little bit and allow their child because they might be like well I'm an alumni of Ole Miss and that's where I want my child you know my child to go but you're like well maybe they don't want to go there how do you get them to have that confidence that courage to stand up and be independent what role can you do you play to navigate the parents first I think that's a, a great question. And I think that's one that really affects hundreds of thousands of student athletes because parents today are in front of their sons and daughters a lot more than when, let's say, I grew up. Um, so, you know, these young kids have been told what team they're going to play on since almost ultrasound, right? That what team they're going to play on, <laughs> what sport they're going to play, you know, the, the, everything is decided for them. And, and then if there's issues, they've been pulled from this program and put in this program because someone's not coaching them right or something. So the, they've been bounced. They've been told what to do. A lot of the times they have no decision-making power and they sit back and just let people, because that's all they know, let people tell them what to do and they do it. And so our work is, it's critical that parents understand that they can give ownership to their sons and daughters early, earlier and not wait for college because by then, you know, well, let's, well, let's dock it as full because there's all kinds of floundering people in college when if we can prepare them and if parents can get in the backseat earlier and, and really let them drive, let them, you know, fall once in a while, let them have struggles and have to work through that so that they're stronger and that they have some resilience and bounce back because 
that's what their life is going to see. That's what college sports is going to be. That's what the recruiting process is going to be. So we do, uh, we, we really have to work hard with the parents. Yeah, I bet they have to change their mindset and be willing to do that. And um, so we'll let, what do you think? What, what about you? What about the, the navigating and helping parents to let go? Yeah. And, and part of one of what my really critical topics for a young woman is advocacy. How do I speak for myself? How do I um, have those difficult conversations? How do I navigate that conflict? But I also have a parental piece to my program. Um, I haven't found like a lot of parents are really thrilled about that piece. They love it for their daughters, but many of them just kind of want to be left alone. But I do have a parental piece that talks about um, what Barb said, allowing your daughter to fail, the gift of failure and learning um, how to take a backseat when your daughter's trying to advocate for herself. So we have many of those uh, critical topics that um, we, we hope parents can kind of hear some of the things that we're saying. Yeah, I mean, as a parent, it's, it's hard to let your kids do what they feel will work for them. You know, my, my daughter is a, is a tattoo artist and owns her own shop. And, but when she was in high school, went to this big, you know, this major arts college here, high school here, she decided she didn't want to go to college. And I was like, really? I mean, like tears, right? But then I had to step back and go, okay, if that's what you want to do. And I helped her get her first apprenticeship. So, you know, but it's not easy because we do have these expectations because we had expectations on us. So it does, I, I imagine that that, that uh, helping parents to me, because the other benefit of allowing your child to make these kinds of decisions is that you're not there when they go to college. And if you are in total control of every decision they make, they're, I imagine, correct me if I'm wrong, that that's one of the biggest challenges when they get to college is that they don't know how to make a decision. Amen to that. It's like this young woman has lived under her parents' roof for 17, 18 years. Now she steps on her college decision, uh, college campus, and all of these split second decisions are now hers to make. Split seconds, the planning decision, all of those things. So um, those are her decisions to make now after she's lived under her parents' roof. But I see all kinds of parents. I see the parents who are the, they, you know, want to have a say in everything, want to speak for their child. And then I also see the parents who um, have taken a really a back seat and uh, single parents and maybe parents that don't always come to their games and support them. So there's got to be a village of people in place for young women mm. to be successful. And we're just part of that village. I love that part of the village. Yes. Um, so now switching to the coaches. So Barbara, you talked all about, you know, how as a coach, you wanted to, the, you know, the best player on your team, but didn't ask those questions, but you're one who is aware of that. What, how do most coaches approach recruiting these days? Is it similar? Has it changed in any way? Are you seeing any change? Or are they still recruiting to make their team the best that, for themselves? I think one of the issues is um, there are very small windows of opportunity for coaches. You have to come into a program and you have to win right away or you're going to lose your job. And so what they do is come in and, you know, to protect their, their own livelihood. And so many of them have families and they move them to these towns. They, they have to try to win. So they do look at talent immediately. What do they need on their team? And they go try to find those pieces and, and then see if they're, you know, big character people and all of those things. But because the recruiting process is the way it is, they can't really communicate much with these kids until later in their high school years. And so a lot of the stuff is not done until, you know, I, I surveyed coaches around the country and asked them, you know, when do you really know what you've gotten in your recruiting class? And 95% of them said, we don't know what we get until one or two years after they've been on campus. That's when we really know what, we, what we've gotten, what we've signed. 
And by then, you know, it, the, the kids are unhappy or they're transferring or they've become, you know, angry players and things and it causes issues on a team. So it really is a really tough, tough recruiting process. That's why I said before, I think a lot of the ownership has to be on the student athlete who can start when they're in eighth grade or freshman year and really start trying on these uh, campuses and these coaches and these leadership styles and really try to understand what they're getting into so that the work when it comes later and the coaches can talk to them, they've got questions lined up, they can they understand how to figure out what's what's needed so that they can actually help the college coaches find the right people. Hmm. Yeah, because as you were saying, so many of them leave in the first year and they've just they're they haven't even gotten to that point where the coach will even know if they're, you know, how they really they, they haven't reached their their that uh what would you call it an athlete, you know, that pinnacle, that point where that potential. That put that full potential, yeah. So well let what about you? Do you do you find that coaches want to work with you? I mean, have you, because you probably, both of you were coaches for so long and know so many that do you find, do you actually reach out to coaches as well where you kind of, you know, help be that middle person in a certain sure, way? Sure, sure. I think, um, yeah, we, I have reached out before and um, there are many colleges that are so receptive to what. I'm doing. And then there's colleges that sort of just don't want you to touch their kid. Um, uh, but that does, that part doesn't matter to me. I, we reach out more to the parents and to the student athlete and we're there in any way that they uh, want us to be uh, after they go through our program. I offer eight months of support once a young woman gets on her college campus. Mm -hmm. So now if she has any issues that maybe she doesn't want to talk to her parents about or basketball. I'm not starting. I'm not playing. We can have a lot of dialogue around those things. And I believe I can offer, you know, my experience and my advice in that uh, arena. And I also have parents who reach out to me too. My daughter's miserable. She's this, she's that. And then we develop a plan on how she can advocate for herself or questions to ask her or maybe things to think about. Mm. Um, so self-awareness is obviously the biggest part of this. And this is where the three of us are and my business, I have other partners as well, but this is where we, we come together really so much in that we help, uh, people at young people, adults, just learn to become aware of what their needs are in our case. It is through mindful practices, right? Mm -hmm. Learning how to be present, learning how to be quiet so that you can clear away the, the junk and all the distractions in your head and the phones and everything so that you can get to the heart of who you are, right? So what do you, uh, each of you have have tools that you use um, to help develop that self-awareness. Can you just give an example, each of you, of what you what you use? I know, Barb, you said you have a, an assessment. So an example of some questions, one or two questions in that assessment where, you know, that would help develop that self-awareness. And then we'll let same to you. Well, we use Live Free Mindset. That's what we use, Phyllis. Woo! <laughs> Live free mindfully, yeah. Oh, mindfully, yeah. Oh, geez, I got it wrong already. But it is a mindset. Okay. It is a mindset. It is a mindset. Which is, yep, affects your mindset. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. I think you're, you know, you're right on. I, I mean, like our assessment will ask them things like, what, what's, you know, here's a, a bunch of things to look at. What, what things? How important is this to you? How important is this to you? And these are things that people wouldn't ask, like, you know. Is it important to you to have a, a, a clean desk? You know, mm. is it important to you? That's an organizational thing. Is it important yeah. to you to, um, you know, what, what, how do you look at feedback? Do you like a lot of feedback or a little feedback? And what does that, you know, how important is that to you? And, and so it draws out this thinking of, 
Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I do like this style of coaching. I do like this style. I look at, I don't want to sit. I don't want a program where I have to sit. I, I want to play right away or, you know, the culture, what I'm looking for are, are these things in the culture. And so it goes beyond the sport actually. Um, and just lets them think about, you know, I'm a high school or an eighth grade person. What's important to me right now? And then we take those things and we draw up the plan from that. So this assessment, I think, is, is kind of like you're saying, just sit back, get, put the sport down for a minute and think about things that are important to you and how we can make that work in the recruiting process. And, and these questions are things they've never thought about before. And so it could take a while. Again, this is where, you know, a, a breathing practice or something that gets them really calm and quiet and clear, they can better answer those questions. Willette, how about you? Yeah, I mean, the same thing as what Barb's talking about. I ask a lot of questions about sort of where they are and uh, how they feel about certain things and, the, you know, maybe not necessarily a relationship to their parents, but how they feel when their parents are you know, in the stands or whatever, there's many questions to be asked, but um, by the time I get them from Barb, there's more self-awareness, but we really dive into um, just finding out really uh, how they view themselves more than just as an athlete. I, I really like to find out who they are outside of being, them being a student athlete, what's important to them, um, what are the, where do they see themselves in five or 10 years, what's their passion, those things. So they know they're more than a student athlete. And I think that's been very, very helpful when they find out that they're more than just a student athlete. As you said, when we started this conversation, uh, we'll let about this is the most holistic approach is the whole child. If they just, and then I'm sure if, especially if they're a particularly good athlete, and I guess that's what I'm saying, to get into college, you got to be committed and you have to have spent some time playing and you, you are, you know, better than the average probably. And, um, and so uh, to, to really get to know yourself and, and be confident enough and um, to be able to defy the pressures mm -hmm. of parents and coaches, because it must feel really good to have a coach. Maybe there'll be several coaches coming after you. How do you choose? Right. Mm -hmm. And, and there could be so much pressure. So what you ladies are doing are, is just, fabulous and you know we hope that in the future that we can help support what you do and continue to make this a uh, holistic approach and making them at the end of the day are they going to become come professionals most likely not but you're giving them tools even organizational skills all of these things are life skills you know that they can carry with them beyond co in college and beyond. So kudos to you. And um, thank you ladies so much for sharing your wisdom, doing what you do. And we look forward absolutely to collaborating in the future. So in the meantime, how can the people reach you? Uh, Willette, let's start with you. Yeah, they can reach me by email. It's uh, nextstepww at gmail.com. And then my business phone number is 541-632-3320. So either of those ways they can get a hold of me. Okay, wonderful. How about you, Barb? Yeah, it's uh, Barb at Find My Team. The website is also findmyteam.com. We have blogs on there. We have newsletters they can uh, sign up for. Uh, or they can call us at 612-351-0052. Um, so yeah, anyway, any way they want. I just wanted to add my uh, website is nextsteptransitionalcoaching.com. Uh, okay. And then uh, I have a, a private Facebook page um, and it's called Parents of Aspiring Female College Athletes. They can request to join there and you'll find a lot of great content, interviews, uh, all of that stuff. Um, so that's where I'm most active. We're going to end this as we end all of our uh, practices. And if you can affirm with me, and this is something you can pass on to your, your uh, athletes as well, and parents, this would be good for them too. Bring your hands together and place them in front of your eyes. And then repeat after me. It could be silent or out loud. 
I have a strong mind. Bring your hands to your heart. I have a brave heart. Bring your hand to your navel center. I have a wise body and arms open. I have a noble spirit. Thank you, ladies, so much. Awesome. And you all, you are all for all of those things. Those are the four pillars that, that are the foundation of everything we do. So look forward to seeing you again and you just have a wonderful rest of your day. Thanks, Phyllis. Appreciate you. Right back at you, Phyllis. And congrats what you're doing as well, because it's the whole person. It's, it's all of it. So thank you for what you do as well.